بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Alhamdulillah, we have tawfiq to continue our reflections on Surah Al-Hujurat. We said the first five verses are about the manners that we should observe with respect to the Prophet. The first verse was, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله واتقوا الله إن الله سميع عليم. All those who believe do not precede Allah سبحانه وتعالى and His Messenger and fear God. Truly, God is hearing and knowledgeable. So Alhamdulillah, we explained this, and inshallah, uh, we have some more to say because these five are related to each other, and inshallah, I will mention some incidents, so we'll be more clarified. But we already talked about the meaning. Verse 2, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtan nabi. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats in a very uh, honoring way. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O those who believe, don't raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. Means when Prophet is talking and you want to speak to him, don't be sometimes, you know, very excited or na'uzubillah, angry. Because sometimes we are excited and we speak very loudly. Sometimes we are angry, we speak loudly. So none of these should let you raise your voice and tone above the voice or tone of the prophet. You have to observe maximum politeness when you are dealing with each other, but especially with people who are older than you, with your parents, with your teachers, and with Imam, and with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضِ And do not make your speech very open in the way that you talk to each other. Mufassirin have different interpretations here. One is that they say this means the same thing, it's emphasis, it's ta'akid, about the same thing. So, la tajharu lahu bil qawl, they say is the same as la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtana. Means when you speak with the Prophet, don't speak very loudly. But some others have said, la tajharu lahu bil qawl, means don't speak with him in the way that you are very informal. For example, don't say, Ya Muhammad, say, Ya Rasulullah. You say, Ya Muhammad, very informal. Another interpretation is that it is different from La Tarfa'u Aswatakum Fawqa Sawtan Nabi because La Tarfa'u Aswatakum Fawqa Sawtan Nabi is when the Prophet is speaking and you are speaking. So there's a conversation between you and the Prophet. Sawtan Nabi, so Rasulullah is speaking. Aswatakum, you are also speaking 
Don't raise your voice above his voice. But la tajharu lahu bilqul is for when the Prophet can be silent. You are speaking and he is listening. Maybe you are speaking to each other. Or maybe you are speaking to him but he is not saying anything. It's not polite that you speak loudly to each other or to the Prophet in his presence. So the first is for when you talk to the Prophet and he talks back. The second is when you speak in his presence, even if he might be not your addressee. Maybe you are talking to someone else. In any case, the Prophet can be silent in the second sentence. And tahbata a'malukum. Why you should be observing this manner, this etiquette? Because if you don't observe, your actions can be destroyed. Ihbatul amal means the actions are dropped, are destroyed. For example, this is a big discussion in Elmul Kalam that certain things can damage our actions in the same way that sometimes very good deeds can ruin sins sometimes good actions can take away bad deeds also, sometimes very bad deeds can do this with the good deeds. For example, in ashrakta, la yahbatanna amaluk. If you become mushrik, your actions. Maybe you have done lots of good actions before. Maybe still also you do some good actions, but this will destroy them. One of the things that can destroy. Do hapt is if someone is disrespectful to the Prophet. Someone is trying to offend, to insult the Prophet. And if someone is unintentionally doing this, he is on the edge. We are not saying every person who unconsciously or unintentionally speaks like this is losing his you know, faith and deeds, but you are on the edge. You have to be very careful. Because speaking to Rasulullah is not like speaking to a normal person, to an ordinary person. Even with ordinary person, you have to be very careful because if God forbid I say something and I break heart of someone, Allah may be angry with me, even an ordinary person. Maybe someone even younger than me. I cannot say because I am old, I can speak to children as I like. Or, you know, these are my own children or grandchildren. No, we have to be very careful not to offend anyone, not to break anyone's feelings and heart. But when it comes to the prophet, it's extra important that you observe these things. So, either you lose your amal or you are on the edge. So you have to be very careful. And you don't know. You didn't want this. But because you were careless, you put yourself into this <coughs> terrible situation. <coughs> there is a story here that we find in the books on tafsir and history about this ayah. It is said a group of Tamim tribe. We say Bani Tamim, means the people who were from Tamim tribe. With some of their leaders, with some of their very important figures, 
they went to Medina. And when they entered Masjid of the Prophet, you know, Prophet's homes were next to each other, like rooms. And they were opening to the Masjid. In the beginning, other people also had their doors open to the masjid, but fasad al abwaba illa baba. Then Allah has to close them, ask them to open a door from outside and come from the entrance of masjid, except for his home and Amirul Mu'minin. So these people went inside masjid where doors of the home of the Prophet are opened. And salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Said, Ya Muhammad, Ukhruj ilayna. They called him with his first name. They said, Come to us. And they didn't go next to the door and, you know, politely. They shouted, You know, come out to us. So, the Prophet وسلم, came out and they said, We have our khatib and he is going to speak. So Rasulullah said, Okay. So one of them who was very eloquent in giving a speech started talking about Bani Tamim. You know, their history, you know, some of their, I don't know, achievements, you know, something that they were very proud of. Then Rasulullah asked, Sabit ibn Qais. Rasulullah had some people for different tasks. For example, Bilal was Muazzin for Rasulullah. Hassan ibn Sabit was the poet for Rasulullah. We will mention him in this story. Qais ibn Thabit was khatib for Rasulullah. So they had people with different skills and talents. This is also shows that how as a leader, you should find talents in people and invest and then utilize their skills and talents. So after their khatib spoke, Rasulullah said to Thabit ibn Qais, you speak. And he made such a good speech. That was much better than what they said. Then their poet stood up and recited some poem. And then Rasulullah said to Hassan ibn Thabit, it's now your turn. And he also made some beautiful recitation of poem. Then one of them who was called Aqra'ah, said this man's people their speech was better than us their poem was better than us <laughs> they are much better than us it was good that he was either a very honest person or the difference was so much that he could not deny it look at the kindness of the prophet they came all the way disturbed him asked him to come out and asked for a kind of, you know, competition. But when Rasulullah saw that they are, you know, feeling defeated, then it is said that Rasulullah said to bring some gifts for them. He gave them some gifts, and then this led to, this akhlaq of Prophet led to them becoming Muslims. So they say this story was the story of revelation of this ayah, at least one of the incidents which is mentioned, which are mentioned. La tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt al-nabi wa la tajharu lahu bil-qawl. There is another story which is sensitive a little bit, but I just say what is in the books without any judgment or without any you know evaluation 
you know, year nine after Hijrah is known as Amul Wufud, the year of delegations. Because in the year nine, the Prophet was in Medina for 10 years. So year nine is year of Wufud, delegations. Because that was the year that Rasulullah received lots of delegations coming and embracing Islam. So they didn't embrace Islam one after another. Group. One group after another group. So delegation used to go and declare their faith. So one delegation went from the same tribe, Bani Tamim. And it is said that when they declared their faith as a community, as a group, the first caliph said to Rasulullah to appoint Qa'qa, who was one of them, as their leader. And the second caliph said, make Aqra, the son of Habis, their leader. This story is in Syria ibn Hisham and also in Sahih Bukhari. Then the first caliph and second caliph started disagreeing. So, so the first nominated someone, the second nominated another person, and then they started disagreeing. And the first said to the second, you mentioned another one to just disagree with me. But the second said, I didn't want to disagree with you. I just said my own opinion. Then their voice was raised. And then this ayah was revealed. According to Siriya ibn Hisham and Sahih Bukhari. That you are not supposed, first of all, why you don't wait for the Prophet himself to decide? If Prophet wants your opinion, of course, Prophet many times was asking for opinion. Okay, he would tell you, what is your opinion? There is no point that you first rush in nominating people. Maybe the Prophet now feels bad to say no this, to this person or to that person. When you mention someone's name, it makes it difficult for the Prophet to say no. Plus, now you disagree with each other in front of the Prophet. This is not also a good thing. Another incident that we have, it's after the demise of the Prophet. You know that when Ahlul Bayt salam, Imam Hussein and other members of the family of the Prophet wanted to bury Imam Hassan alayhi salam in Masjid al-Nabi or in the house of the Prophet next to the Masjid, there was an objection. Uh, one of the wives of the Prophet objected to this issue and there was a kind of quarrel. As soon as it reached this point, Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي. We are in the presence of the Prophet. It is true that Prophet has passed away, but he is not dead. He is present. You know, when we go to Ziyara, we say, أشهد أنك تشهد مقامي. Mashat, you say, أشهد أنك تشهد مقامي وتسمع كلامي وترد سلامي. You are aware that I am here. And you hear my speech and you reply to my salam. So, even when the Prophet has passed away, and we are in his shrine. We have to observe this etiquette. So Imam Hussein said, 
لا ترفع أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. And he said, I heard from Prophet, or he quoted from the Prophet, إن الله حرم من المؤمنين أموات ما حرم منهم أحياء. Whatever was prohibited to do to a person when he is alive, it is also prohibited to do when he is dead. Those, you are, those of you are familiar with uh, my discussions about end of life, you know I quote this rule, and from this rule, our fuqaha say, and actually it's mentioned in hadith very clearly, that you cannot harm the body of a dead person. You cannot even cause injury to the body of a dead person, unless there is a great need, like there is a suspicion of murder or for saving someone else's life. That's another issue. But the first principle is when someone is dead, you should have the same respect to this body that you used to have when this person was alive. And even if you cause injury to this, you may need to pay dia. Although he's dead. So Imam Hussein said, you cannot in this place that the Prophet is not physically with us, but spiritually is with us, you cannot raise your voice. So then they, of course, decided to take the body of Imam Hassan away. So we have to be very careful when we go to the shrines for ziyara. We don't want to say the ayah is talking about our situation in the shrines directly because there is no salt over there from Imam. But the idea is there that you have to be respectful. Anything that is a sign of lacking respect to the personality that we are visiting is to be stopped. So if you are in the shrine, okay, there is azan, call for prayer, okay. Maybe there is a recitation, okay. But for example, two people go to the shrine and, you know, one person starts, you know, speaking to his friend in the shrine, you know, loudly. This is not compatible with adab of ziyara. Indeed, you should not speak with people Unless necessary. Or, you know, if, of course, inshallah, this doesn't happen, someone, you know, picks up his phone and over phone and speaks with another person inside the shrine. If you want to speak with someone, please go out. Because here you have to feel the presence of Imam or the Prophet and be very respectful. Even I believe, if you are not speaking to someone, but for example, you are reciting for yourself Quran or Dua, you shouldn't speak too loudly. If there is one reciter who is reciting for everyone, that's different. For example, from the a speaker of Haram, Someone is reciting Azan or Quran or giving lecture, everyone is listening, it's okay. But if every group, they recite loudly, every person recites loudly, it becomes too noisy. And it's not, I think, compatible with the manners of Ziyar. Especially, the reality is that most of us don't recite beautifully. <laughs> Maybe you enjoy your recitation, but the person next to you is suffering. You are not you know, a professional reciter. So your voice, your recitation can annoy other people. Or 
even if you are a good reciter, you can disturb them. This person has come from another part of the world or another part of, for example, country, wants to sit there and be polite and just from heart to the soul of the prophet or imam wants to communicate. And you keep, you know, reciting, you know, someone says, you know, say salawat loudly. Another says, say salawat loudly. I think this is not very good. If you go to Qom and Najaf or Karbala, in my understanding, maybe I am wrong. In my understanding, the quietest place in Qom, Najaf, Mashhad, Karbala must be Haram. That must be the quietest place. Yes, time of Azan is different. Few minutes before Azan, after, but after that should be very quiet. Or at least we should have quiet zones in the Haram. Not that everyone is shouting and you know making noise. This is my opinion. I don't want to offend anyone, but let's think about it. Which one shows more appreciation of the place that we are visiting? So, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt al-nabi wa la tajharu lahu bilqawl كجهر بعضكم لبعض أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون. and then Allah subhanahu wa taala to show appreciation of those who observe says إن الذين يغضون أصواتهم عند رسول الله. now those people who lower their voice when they are with the prophet they Observe this manner. How much Allah is praising them. In Arabic, means to lower. It can be for gaze. Means lower your gaze. Don't look at a stranger, woman, for example, or man, you know, lower your gaze. Also, it is used for voice. It's for looking. This is for voice. So your voice should be not too loud. Those who lower their voice in the Rasulullah, in the presence of the Prophet, these are the people that Allah has tested their hearts for taqwa. Means taqwa is found after test and examination in their heart. You know how Allah is pleased with such people that have adab. They have maghfira, forgiveness, to solve the problems from the past. And great reward to enjoy for future. So this is the beauty of observing this ada. Then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَأْقِلُونَ Those who call you from behind the rooms. Hujra, still, you know, in Qom, for example, Najaf, you know, we say Hujra. Hujra, we use it for room. It comes from Hajr. Hajr, means to stop, to block. When you have a room which is surrounded with wall and door, means you have a kind of privacy. Not everyone can enter, not everyone can watch. So it is called hojra. It's like a, a kind of safe and secure place. Hojra is plural. Because Rasulullah had few rooms and his family, his wives used to 
stay in these rooms. Those who call you from behind the walls, most of them don't understand. Means that out of ignorance, out of not being very intelligent, they do these things. And as I said yesterday, maybe it's a kind of also finding an excuse for them. That it's not that they do it deliberately. If they were intelligent, you know, they would not have done this. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ If they were patient and waited, they could send a message, they could, for example, knock the door, they could wait for the time that the Prophet comes out himself for Salat, you know, he was at least coming, you know, five times, for example, most of the days for Salat out. Or they could, you know, just politely go next to the door and ask for a meeting. If they were patient, it was better for them. Again, but Allah says, you know, Allah is forgiving. So when we give you an instruction, Allah says, okay, don't worry about the past. He is forgiving. Rahim, he is merciful. The main thing is, from now on, change yourself. If you stop bad behavior and bad practice, he's forgiving. He is very kind and merciful. From now on, don't say it's too late. I have already, you know, done so many bad things that it's too late for me. There is no chance of change or return. No, there is a chance. But if from now on you act properly. Alhamdulillah, we finished reflection on the first five verses of Surah Al-Hujurat. We are connected to each other. Inshallah, tomorrow I talk a little bit about the concept of adab, and then we move on to the second part of the surah of Hujurat, inshallah.